This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. We still have no specifics on the type of uh, chemicals that are inside the building. We would say that there were cylinders placed inside and that was what exploded. Mad as a hatter, blind as a bat, dry as a bone, hot as a biscuit. It only takes a thimbleful of, of, this, of this compound to cause this. Where they're awake, they're not comatose, but they're confused, they're um, delirious. They're talking about things that aren't there. It uh, paralyzes uh, the muscles, it paralyzes uh, the central nervous system activity, uh, causes convulsions and, and death. Welcome. My name is Dr. John Blossom. I'm here with you today in the Office of Emergency Services for the County of San Diego. Were there to be a disaster, this place would be a veritable beehive of activity. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever wondered why it is that you don't see more chaos in the event of disasters? Well, there's a reason. There are systems in place that have been carefully designed for law enforcement, health professionals, fire responders to work together. This series is designed to help you have a better understanding of how important it is to prepare for disasters. Typically, we think of bioterrorism as a public health emergency where there would be a release of a weaponized form of anthrax or some other bioterrorism agent. It goes deep into the lung and then that spore then what's called germinates. So basically what you have is in the middle of your chest you have bloody pus. Bloody pus. Dr. Aragon really got my attention with that one. If you've been watching primetime television lately, perhaps you saw the episodes that I've seen. The one in which a suspicious white powder comes tumbling out into an office. It proves to be anthrax. Or the one in which a colorless, odorless, and deadly gas is released by terrorists in a subway. Are these far-fetched scenarios? Well, not really. Let's see what we can learn from our experts who have dealt with these very situations. The University of California has a, a remarkable number of outstanding professors. My own work has been in the medical school at UC San Francisco. We have outstanding talent in all of the five medical schools and our schools of public health. Our medical director for this project is Dr. Christian Sandrock, who I'm pleased to say has made time in his busy schedule to be here with us today. Christian, could you share with us what it is that you do for a living? Sure. I'd be happy to tell you what I do for a living. So, uh, by training, I'm an infectious disease pulmonary and critical care physician, and I'm on faculty at the University of California Davis School of Medicine. And most of my area is in emergency preparedness, um, but particularly in the outbreak of infectious diseases. So that's encompassed um, both at the hospital and institutional level, so dealing with surge capacity and other um, issues at the hospital, all the way and up through um, local and state public health. So doing plans and preparedness at multiple levels as well. Christian, I understand that one of the major categories of disaster, uh, and therefore disaster preparedness, uh, relates to chemicals. Could you help me understand that a little better. Yeah, John, there's um, 
so there's a lot of categories of sort of terrorism and terrorism-based um, agents. And if we really broke them down into bigger categories, there would be the biologicals, which are usually bacteria slash virus with a few toxins, um, radiological agents, and then lastly would be chemical. If you look at chemical warfare per se, uh, it really started uh, most significantly in World War I. And um, I think that most uh, would uh, probably put that on the German side, uh, utilizing uh, chlorine and mustard gas initially. Huge numbers of people were exposed. Uh, there were significant uh, deaths. The chemical in particular um, that, that we're talking about, they really sort of came about, for the most part, in the terrorism side um, during the First and Second World War. So these were agents of warfare that um, were designed you know, to use against the enemy. And that's where most of that developing uh, portion came forward. War gas does not shatter arms and legs as bullets and bomb fragments do. The real purpose of the enemy in using war gas is to spread fear and panic. And then as uh, the history evolved of, of these uh, weapons, uh, Second World War brought on uh, really a, a very concerning uh, group of uh, gases, uh, and these were the organophosphates. And sarin gas is one of them that uh, is an organophosphate inhibitor. It uh, paralyzes uh, the muscles. It paralyzes uh, the central nervous system activity, uh, causes convulsions and, and death through secretion formation and uh, lack of muscle activity. So as health practitioners, it's kind of important to know where it came from to some degree because, number one, that lets you know that these are potentially agents of terrorism that you know, certain groups could have been trained on using and we could still potentially see in the future. Um, second is many of these agents um, sort of were derived and went in a direction of industry. And that's important. So, for example, organophosphates being a classic um, derivative of some of the nerve agents, that we use them in industry a lot and industrial accidents can then become uh, a feature of that as well. Uh, organophosphates have gone in two basic directions. One is they've been used as pesticides and uh, large numbers of them have been used worldwide to control pests and, and, and crops. The other direction has been um, a more sophisticated weapons of war and the concentration requirements and the uh, lethality of those agents have gone up dramatically. You know, when I, many years ago, was in practice in Mendota, I had a case of organophosphate poisoning that was a, a suicide attempt. It's interesting that this goes all the way back to World War II in, in Germany, but chemical agents aren't the only ones that you mentioned. Now, you mentioned biological agents. Could you uh, say a little bit about that, too, please? Of course. So uh, the biologic category, you know, usually we generally break that down into the larger things such as viruses, bacteria, and then toxins, so a classic toxin being the botulinum toxin, which it's not really a living organism but a product of it um, that will cause disease. And those agents are, are very different in their category in general than the chemical agents. Now, the chemical agents, when we do see them, you're usually exposed, um, you know, as when they present to you as a healthcare provider, the exposure is pretty rapid and you notice the symptoms have rapid onset. Um, the biologic agents are not quite so, and what they'll have is usually an incubation period because you're being exposed, in most cases, outside of you know, botulinum or, or ricin, which is a toxin. A lot of the thinking around biological weapons that emerged out of the military preparing for the release of biological weapons during warfare. Biological weapons are uh, ones that have uh, been infrequently used and uh, really are uh, unconventional. They're, they're very covert, uh, as opposed to the overtness of a, a, a conventional weapon. If I have troops in the field, and somebody releases a biological weapon, how am I going to detect that? So it makes sense that it would probably be something that's aerosolized because you have, in wars, you have airplanes. It's just part of war. And, and so you can imagine, instead of dropping bombs, they could be dropping, they could be dropping uh, biological agents. You are being exposed to an agent. It needs time to incubate, then produce the onset of symptoms and show up. And because of that delay... Well, let me ask you a question. The, uh, this uh, concept of the incubation period, some people may not be familiar uh, with what that means. So a person who uh, has been exposed and gotten the illness might be walking around and looking okay? Yeah, so the concept of an incubation period is, you know, from the time of exposure to the time of symptoms, that can be a lag time. It can be as short as, you know, say 12 to 24 hours. It could be long as a few days. 
And in that period, they're walking around fine, and they may, you know, be minimally symptomatic or not symptomatic at all, but a few things can happen. They potentially be, can be contagious in that period, which then impacts the spread within, you know, their family and their community um, to larger areas within, you know, bigger communities in the country. Um, and the second thing is then, you know, that causes a delay in presentation. So if we, for example, were to have a large industrial accident like a train derailment with chlorine gas, it's pretty obvious to most people that that's a big acute incident. Train is derailed, there's gas, people are getting immediately sick and, and having contact with that um, agent. With a biologic agent, just like with the anthrax, for example, they might have inhaled the powder, but a time period goes and you don't really make that initial connection. And then those people present critically ill to healthcare providers in the hospital, and that has to be elucidated after the fact. And if it is contagious, it's sort of a self-propagating event. While that train derailment and recovery is just a single event followed by recovery, this is one, you know, these infectious agents continue to propagate themselves as they spread and potentially can have more fear and damage, which is really one of the underpinnings of the biologic agents. on the type of uh, chemicals that are inside the building. They would say that there was cylinders. The responders would potentially be different uh, in a terrorist attack with a conventional weapon. They would be the normal emergency responders, police, fire, EMS. Whereas with a, a biological weapon, uh, is likely that the uh, first responders would be the typical medical um, care uh, system of that uh, community. With bioterrorism, Hospital personnel may be the first people to come in contact with patients who are presenting to the hospital with flu-like symptoms. We actually coined a term first receivers to describe this type of setting. Health providers really should know about chemical and biological agents for a number of reasons. Uh, foremost, and based on our training, really knowing about the agents, what they can do, how to prevent them and how to treat them really helps our patients and that's that's what we're trained to do but more importantly I think they really need to know about the continuum of response and how to respond and also self-protection with chemicals now you you think more of first responders immediate symptoms the need for decontamination the need for uh, some uh, some infrastructure to approach a, uh, a, a mass casualty event meaning that you know our, where are these patients primarily going to be treated, meaning in the field, en route to the emergency department, right outside the emergency department, later on in the hospital, in the ICU. And outside of that, what protection measures do they need to take? So certain chemical agents you can actually get contaminated from and get symptomatic yourself, such as one of the nerve agents. Or if it's a biologic agent, they can be contagious and spread to healthcare workers, which we've seen in multiple outbreaks of disease, which then puts you at risk. In terms of most of our biologic events, we're really dealing with a public health phenomenon. We're dealing with a clandestine incorporation of, of an infective agent into the population in an attempt to uh, mimic an outbreak that's not immediately identified. If this is a contagious agent, like plague, this could spread to other healthcare providers. So having that knowledge and having that ability to protect yourself certainly is very important, and every healthcare provider needs to know that. Among the uh, arsenal of tools that terrorists can use, one that's uh, particularly frightening is the dirty bomb. Could you talk about that a little bit, please? A dirty bomb, traditionally, although it can be mixed um, in the history, but traditionally it's a conventional explosive device that's usually mixed with some other contaminant, and traditionally that's going to be a radiologic contaminant, um, and usually low levels of radiation. Our probably true risk is probably a, uh, a radiologic dispersion device is probably, I would guess, in terms of a, a terrorist event. If you had to pick one event, I would probably say that a dirty bomb would be probably easy to do or combine that with conventional explosive and a chemical event like a chlorine or organophosphate or, a, or some toxic chemical that could cause a lot of a lot of uh, consternation and, and perhaps even migration and, and mass movement and panic. Terrorists are more interested in usually a statement 
uh, the whole word, word terrorists implies inducing terror. And so their goal may not be to uh, kill large numbers. It may be to generate fear. Certainly uh, radioactivity, a dirty bomb, uh, would have a huge psychological impact. Many studies have been done looking at dirty bombs, and really fear is a big, big driving factor behind a dirty bomb when in fact most of the injury and damage is going to be caused by the conventional explosion and the subsequent radiation that is associated with a dirty bomb is very often, at least in most of the analyses, on the lower side. I was in New York witnessing a training for paramedics where there was a dirty bomb explosion. But the paramedics had been so well trained to be concerned about radiation and had their radiation detectors out at this training and found indeed it was a dirty bomb, which was good, that they did not go in and take care of the patients for nearly one hour. Had this been real, people would have died of traumatic injuries because of the concern about radiation, which was actually very minimal. That training experience led us to be more careful about teaching people that you must take care of traumatic injuries first in a dirty bomb event. Having healthcare providers know that and know that their risk when they respond is going to be small because it's a low dose for a short time, that um, they can at least provide adequate response or take a very simple and prote basic protective measures for that low level radiation that would allow them to have an adequate response. I always remind myself that the, the reason for that act then is to create terror more than it is to create damage. Or economic. So if uh -huh. a dirty bomb actually contaminates a space, like such as a workspace, um, you know, it may be low levels of radiation, but if you're going to work there every day for the next 30 years, that can become a problem. So the cleanup efforts becomes a big economic nightmare. So it may be economic in addition to fear. Healthcare professionals have to worry about terrorist events, but there are also industrial accidents that they have to be concerned about. Could you describe uh, your experience in regard to industrial accidents a little bit? Industrial accidents, you know, um, again, can carry a form of either, you know, coming to you, meaning at your place of work or even in your home. They can be generally released in the community um, or they can actually be, you know, um, something that, that happened while you're traveling, so such as a train derailment, um, you know, another truck accident. So they're really pretty much present both in your home or your workplace and then outside while you're traveling as well, which is slightly different than terrorism. Many people feel if they're at a home, in their house, you know, terrorism is significantly less real for them, while industrial accidents can certainly overlap in that area. It doesn't take much to look at the trains and to see what's being carried with the chlorine and the uh, or, and our pesticides and the petrochemicals that are being that are being carted across California on any given day a chemical event is uh, as an industrial accident is there industrial accidents can be very variable and they certainly can either be deadly or they don't necessarily have to have a large volume of patients they can just be that individual patient so, um, for example, we recently had a patient who was exposed to a fertilizer agent and, you know, came in with, with a presentation that was not picked up by any of the healthcare providers because it was just not on their radar. And it was an individual patient, which is not something many healthcare providers would think of. They think of a terrorist act or a larger industrial accident, you're going to have tens to hundreds to thousands of patients. And very often it can be one patient who can then still put you at risk for contamination, but also becomes, you know, someone that you need to be very aware of for, for treatment options. You can still, if you drink enough of our own pesticide in the United States, can have a wonderful cholinergic crisis. Uh, but, in, uh, but in these small villages in Malaysia and Indonesia, it only takes a thimbleful of, of, this, of this compound to cause this. And it is, it, it, it's, and it's an amazing phenomena to watch and, and people don't know what they're doing and, and they die. They frequently die from it. Bhopal, India, the, the name, uh, an incredible disaster. Uh, what happened? There was a union carbide plant and this was in the early 80s, I think 1983 or 84, and there was a large industrial release, accidental release, of isomethyl cyanide 
which really ended up spreading to the larger community and killing thousands of people, animals, and destroying most of the vegetation surrounding there. Um, it's considered one of the biggest industrial accidents in the world, if not the biggest. And I think there were certain things that really um, changed the way we view industrial accidents uh, worldwide um, after that occurrence. So some of the big things that we saw out of there was just really the lack of structure and preparedness at the plant. So if you read up on the data and the literature, there's long discussions about the valves being leaky, the equipment being leaky, the sensor alarms and the alarms weren't working. Um, and that really led to this large, you know, or I should say enhanced this large release. Um, the practices that the workers were trained on and what they did, as well as the equipment and protection that they wore, really was almost non-existent and accelerated um, the spread of this cyanide, um, which then uh, leaked out into the community. The geographic contribution was significant in that the, in that the chemical uh, factory was above uh, this poor uh, area of the, of the city, and that poor area acted as almost a valley to uh, contain the, um, the gas that was uh, given off uh, accidentally in this uh, industrial hazmat uh, catastrophe. The resultant uh, uh, exposure of the gas to uh, the uh, people of, uh, poorer people of Bhopal was uh, significant, and uh, there may well be uh, long-term residuals for those that uh, survived. Once it was in the community and caused, you know, over two or three thousand head of cattle to die immediately, um, you know, all the deaths in the people, and then that surge upon the healthcare system, there was no hospital and healthcare infrastructure there to really respond and handle that, that disaster. So I think it really showed that, you know, having the safety mechanisms in place and having that structure in the plant to contain the accident, number one, is important. Number two, the training of the people became important. And then number three, the larger community response, including healthcare and healthcare structures, is also really important. And I think those were the big lessons that, you know, we, we can learn from Bhopal among many, but some so, of the big ones that would apply to at least, you know, more, more developed high income countries where these regulations exist by law. If there had been an organized uh, hazmat uh, plan um, uh, that to would have been applicable easily to that situation. Uh, lives potentially could have been saved. Uh, analysis of potential gas flow could have been done beforehand. These are standard things that are done in chemical factories now. Looking at if there is an accident, which way would the gas flow and things like that. But, but I think that the point that uh, having a plan is a critical component to any potential response to a hazmat uh, or a natural disaster or to a terrorist uh, use of war gases or biologicals. You have to have a plan or you'll never be able to execute it under the stresses of, a, of an incident. Could you foresee a Bhopal someday happening in the United States or are we better prepared than that? Yeah, I would like to say we're better prepared. So industrial regulations and limitations certainly allow for the containment in a much, uh, much more rapid fashion. Um, we have a structured hazmat response. Um, many of these companies have plans and mechanisms in place, including a lot of mandated training, which their workers will go through. So to have that large scale of an accident with a common industrial agent, such as isomethyl cyanide, is really, I, I think, un unlikely um, in the United States and many, uh, many countries around the world today, even, even India. I think this would be a remote thing to happen in India now. There was a horrific attack uh, uh, by a cult in Japan, a Tokyo subway attack. Did you learn anything from it? Uh, I think the, the sarin nerve gas release in Tokyo in the 90s um, was an important lesson in, for healthcare providers in a number of ways, but that was a cult, the Om Shurikyo cult. They were a doomsday cult which sort of had this end of the world philosophy and had tried on a few attempts to release um, you know, this nerve gas and other methods. And they actually had gone into the subway system and had these, um, this gas released within the subway system in multiple cars. Certainly the Tokyo experience was an attempt to use the subway system as a distribution mechanism for a sarin uh, organophosphate uh, poison. 
um, and that was uh, limitedly successful in terms of distributing it through the city, but it was uh, remarkably successful in, in, as a terrorist act in terms of uh, her, uh, damaging, killing, um, and uh, paralyzing the city of Tokyo. And this was something they had planned and worked on for a while, and it did require some uh, technique and some, some engineering, and uh, I think if I remember the history right, that was not the first time they had tried to release you know, the sarin gas in the subway system. They actually had it tried on prior occasions and were unsuccessful in inducing any disease. So um, this was something that was part of their general philosophy in trying to cause mayhem and death um, with as much um, you know, fear and terrorism as possible. There wasn't an explosion that made people alarmed. There was uh, people who dropped sacks or containers of this and then punctured it open with an umbrella and wound up relying on vapor action of these agents to spread. It led to a very large scale response, obviously, so a number of people died. Uh, the response was pretty extensive, obviously, within the community. Um, but it really, you know, for Tokyo, set up the stage of not only local hazmat and decontamination in the field of large numbers of people, but also the idea that many of these people, you know, some of them with, you know, moderate to severe illness, actually walk themselves to the nearest facility. Thousands of patients uh, were exposed, or people were exposed, and then became patients, 80% of which walked in to emergency departments. Now, most uh, plans don't uh, take into a f account the fact that people will not follow normal triaging. Uh, they'll just walk in. And that included, you know, simple clinics, urgent cares, other hospitals. So really that process of that mass response and hysteria in a well-populated city with many of these contaminated people dispersing and walking elsewhere really led us to a number of, of lessons to be learned from that experience. Well, I think one of the uh, take-home lessons for me, based on what you said, is that uh, people don't sort themselves out by how sick they are. I need to go to the emergency room or I'll just go to my... Uh, family physician's office. They go wherever there is a, uh, someone who might be able to help them. A nursing assistant could be recipient of a request for help. Yeah, it can be ever who's, who's ever at the front desk in that clinic at the time. With um, nerve agent poisoning, it's going to affect the acetylcholine at three sites. The brain, okay, causing confusion, coma, seizures. The muscle, causing fasciculations going into paralysis, and the muscarinic receptors, which causes these sludge symptoms, and it causes salivation, lacrimation, urination, diarrhea, GI upset, and emesis, vomiting. As you're watching the patient, you'll see a profuse diaphoresis and sweating. Uh, they'll, they'll usually develop bronchospasm and then have uh, plenty of secretions, lots of oral secretions. Until they lose consciousness, they'll be complaining of gastric uh, uh, pain and abdominal pain. And then later on, we'll have uh, copious amounts of oral secretions uh, with difficulty clearing their airways. Mad as a hatter, blind as a bat, dry as a bone, hot as a biscuit. So they develop this anticholinergic delirium where they're awake, they're not comatose, but they're confused, they have these dilated pupils, they're um, delirious, they're talking about things that aren't there. So obviously in a chemical um, incident such as this, um, you sort of have to have triage, but very rapid initial triage followed by decontamination, meaning that if people walk in the door and you know they're potentially contaminated, you have to sort of realize that they need to be decontaminated before they get further treatment. I think it's important to realize that in the Tokyo sarin attacks is that the healthcare workers um, didn't develop severe poisoning themselves. So they wound up treating these patients for about five hours before they realized what it was. Nobody had to leave their post. So nobody became severely poisoned in this situation. In other situations where there's a big splash contact, I think it's important to think about decontamination and washing any obvious liquid, powder, or anything else off the patients before they're brought into the emergency room. Decontamination is one of the key components, I think, of hospital readiness, and that's an understanding of how you can decontaminate a patient prior to allowing them to come into the hospital. You have to set up a clean line 
but you don't let anybody through until they've been decontaminated. And certainly not letting equipment that was used in the field uh, be brought in uh, in the form of gurneys or resuscitation equipment or bags or anything else that might have been used. And the chemical agents are tricky because you have that decontamination in there. And the last thing you want is even when you have an extremely critically ill patient, you know, either the provider has to get on the appropriate personal protective equipment and render care prior to decontamination, or that patient needs to be decontaminated before they enter that wider healthcare arena where people are less protected. So that step in the midst of, midst of the triage of figuring out who needs more or less immediate care it needs to be considered. Going from the Tokyo experience in which 80% uh, uh, walked into the hospital, they were overwhelmed with the small amount of decontamination ability they had at that hospital. Um, many hazmat sites, uh, approaches, try to decontaminate, appropriately so, at the site prior to uh, sending them to the hospital. But when you have an urban event like uh, Tokyo, uh, that model doesn't work, and you have to be prepared to handle decontamination. So I'm concerned if I'm a family doctor or a chiropractor and uh, patients show up, and I don't know what, uh, whether they're contaminated or not, what tips do you have for decontamination? Yeah, um, decontamination can often be very simple. Most, I should say all hospitals, because of joint commission requirements, are going to have a decontamination plan and the ability to do so. But, you know, smaller clinics and smaller um, healthcare entities that are not necessarily accredited in that manner um, may not. These are highly uh, potent uh, agents, and they have the ability through simple uh, contact to be transferred to the healthcare provider. So uh, many of them can go through routine gloves. Uh, they have no problem going through cotton or, uh, or normal clothing. It is uh, a hallmark in the area of toxicology, particularly of uh, uh, topical or inhalation toxicology, to realize that the, uh, the key to pollution is dilution. So you have to dilute the poison, and uh, certainly that means usually removing their clothing, um, setting up outside showers to uh, dilute off the skin, soap and water uh, being the, probably the best. Uh, but. Uh, hypochlorite, uh, Clorox type of agents being a, a, another way to, uh, to uh, uh, clean them off prior to bringing them into the hospital. And simple things may be obviously limiting the amount of access, so if they walk into a particular door, that's the only way they get in. They don't um, enter into the deeper health care system or the facility. And then really, you know, taking off your clothes and then simple water and soap really will decontaminate about 90 or over 90 percent of all the chemical agents that you're going to have. So those two simple steps and having a plan for that will really get you through most of the, the troubles. Imagine 650 patients with uh, sarin poisoning showing up on your front door and you know how do you distribute those patients once they because there are more of them than there are of your employees. Uh, uh, so that's the kind of uh, of uh, working in advance and, and, and part of that is just being aware of the need to be thinking about that and putting it into the scenarios that you are obligated in the United States uh, to be exercising. I think my take home message is, is that in a large attack it's going to be very confusing. I think in Tokyo it took them five hours to figure out that it was a nerve agent and I think the only way to really improve our chances of making the diagnosis early is by good communication, good observation, and uh, winding up trying to understand with whether the constellation of symptoms that you're seeing could fit into a cholinergic excess or a acetylcholine poisoning. Besides the chemical agents, there are a lot of biological agents that we have to be concerned about. And the one that comes first to mind for me is anthrax. Anthrax is sort of the poster child, I think, more recently of the biological terrorist agents because it was one of the ones most recently used. In the case of it being used as a terrorist weapon, it was used uh, distributed through a postal system and the automatic uh, sorting machines in the, uh, in the postal system turned out to be an excellent way to uh, aerosolize and distribute within the workplace. This was bioterrorism, but if you think about it, this behaved very much like 
chemical terrorism. There was a defined scene. It was sudden impact so that you knew when and where it was and we sent a lights and siren response. We didn't know a lot about anthrax, how it could really work as a spore, how it could be aerosolized, how it can get through envelopes. And as you begin to study anthrax, we began to realize that anthrax in many ways is the perfect bioterrorist agent. Because it's a spore and so it's much more stable than a lot of other um, biological uh, items such as salmonella or some of the other traditional bacteria. Quite frankly, anthrax is very typical of many of the other uh, large agents um, that the CDC has identified as being high risk and that it's also naturally occurring, meaning that we see anthrax occur as natural disease in cattle and sometimes in people as well. Because you have this spore that is so hardy and that can survive in the environment for years that somebody could carry around and then aerosoli aerosolize and expose a group of people and you don't even have to aerosolize it into ambient air. You can go into shopping malls and aerosolize it. We think of bioterrorism as a public health emergency where there would be a release of a weaponized form of anthrax or some other bioterrorism agent and many many people in the same location such as a sporting event or a shopping mall would be exposed and present then to healthcare facilities several days later with nonspecific flu-like symptoms. The thing that's tricky about anthrax is with many of the other biologicals outside of botulism and ricin is that they have a delayed presentation. So we talked about this idea of an incubation period. So you know from the time that those spores are inhaled until when you get symptomatic disease can be very variable and it also depends on the type of infection you get. Some people can get a cutaneous or skin infection, which might take, you know, a week or two in order to progress. Some people can inhale it and get a predominant pneumonia and uh, what we call mediastinitis or inflammation in the chest, which can actually happen very rapidly over, you know, a day to two days. When the spore is inhaled, it goes deep into the lung, and then that spore, then what's called germinates, it germinates and then it starts growing, producing not just toxins that can cause septic shock, but also causes a lot of necrosis and hemorrhaging. So basically what you have is in the middle of your chest, you have bloody pus. We saw a huge increase in white powder incidents across the country. And we used a lot of resources because we had to take each one seriously. We knew we actually had anthrax in this country. So we had to send a response if it was a citizen who was calling, we had to have somebody ready to respond within a healthcare facility if white powder was found within the healthcare facility. And fortunately, most of them did not turn out to be anything sinister. Once the to that toxin is out, it's really hard to reverse it. So even when you give antibiotics, the mortality rate is going to be high probably at least 50% once people have gotten to that stage. So you can have a whole group of people who are presenting with symptoms that are not very specific. Some fever, chest pain, you know, they, they think they have the flu, and it could be an anthrax exposure. So anthrax was very scary. And we would have to suspect that this is bioterrorism and initiate an epidemiologic investigation through the public health department and also involve law enforcement because it's a crime in order to determine that all these people were at the same place at the same time a few days earlier. Even when you treat people with antibiotics, that spore can continue to exist for a long period of time in somebody's lungs. So not only do you have to give prolonged antibiotics for 60 days, but you also have to vaccinate that population. We had all kinds of crazy things. Uh, people who had white powder from the donuts. I actually visited one of my staff in New Orleans and went to Café du Monde right before I went to the airport. And if you know that at all, the vignettes have the wonderful white sugar powder. And I was afraid to try to get on an airplane with this white powder all over me. But fortunately, I was able to get on. It really has uh, different presentations as well as uh, different progression which then often makes it very hard to detect. Now, my understanding is that uh, one of the first cases to be accurately identified was in Florida, not, not in the D.C. area. Yeah, that's correct. So the, in what we call the index case or the initial case, 
uh, actually happened to be, you know, a reporter in Florida who was the first one to present. Um, not when they went back, was not the first one to open his letter and have exposure, but was the first one to present. And they can often, because of this incubation period, be in geographically different areas as well, which can make it hard to detect. Uh, education of a community, uh, education of providers uh, plays a very important role when you see a patient with an unusual uh, pneumonia or a mediastinal process going on acutely that uh, would make you think of that particular agent and to analyze uh, uh, the clinical cl clues in a way that they don't normally uh, analyze them to be able to think about these potential terrorist attack mechanisms. When I was a little boy, I had a smallpox vaccination, and I remember because we couldn't go swimming or get it wet. Um, what's the status of smallpox today? Yeah, well, smallpox um, currently has an interesting status. It's uh, listed very highly on the agents of biological terrorism, but it's the only one that's not naturally occurring. Smallpox would be a, uh, a viral agent that, that it has a potential for a, a biologic uh, terrorist response. That has substantial potential for person-to-person uh, -person spread, has substantial per, uh, potential to, to develop into an uh, inf uh, epidemic. One case of, uh, of smallpox usually uh, infects 12 other cases. It has such a potential threat, mainly because the world stopped vaccinating, essentially, um, particularly in the United States in the late 60s, early 70s. It was eradicated in the late 70s, and we don't see any naturally occurring disease. If smallpox were, be, were reintroduced, we anticipate that some of the early cases will probably be misdiagnosed because the early smallpox is not going to look like the classic smallpox that you see in pictures. Once we have a confirmed case, anybody that's coming with a rash that may resemble at all in any small way smallpox will be evaluated. If we do see a case of suspected or confirmed smallpox, it's really terrorism until proven otherwise, and it's just been out of circulation completely since the late 70s. There probably are two or three places in the world that, that probably still have a, a form of smallpox that could be utilized to cause an outbreak or, or an epidemic of disease. And those, that was in old Russia and, and in the United States. I got a call from a dermatologist a dermatologist who said to me, I've just seen a case that I think is smallpox. He said to me, this woman just came from Australia. She went straight from the airplane straight to her internist. Her internist sent the patient straight to me. I've, take, I've taken a biopsy. It's been evaluated, but it looked just like smallpox. We could have a, uh, a great outbreak that with a mortality of around 30 percent, but still our public health infrastructure would be just terminated uh, in trying to take that particular bug on. We went ahead and, and, and investigated, investigated the case and um, it turned out not to be smallpox, but we never learned what it was. It probably turned out to be a drug reaction, but that's exactly what we want the clinician to do, to pick up the phone and let us know. And even if it's not smallpox, you know what, that doesn't matter because every time we have a case like that, public health authorities get to test their systems. And in a sense, that is really, really important. You get to test your system. How are we going to interview that patient? How are we going to collect specimens? Who has that patient been in contact with? How are we going to collect the specimen, package it, and get it to the appropriate lab in a timely and safe manner. How is it going to get back to the CDC if the early tests are positive? That whole chain of events that has to happen doesn't get tested often except when we have these, these, these incidents that allow us to test a system. You know, on the one hand, we've really learned that a lot of these uh, agents, uh, infectious or chemical, uh, present very subtly. And on the other hand, we've been told uh, contact the appropriate authorities. How do you, how do you balance out this? Uh, uh, should you be willing to call with potentially a silly question to the health department? Well, 
I think calling the health department really is never silly, um, but it does get tricky as to when is the right time to call, and I think that's what many health care providers have trouble with. It's really important to emphasize to the provider community to feel comfortable about contacting public health really for anything. Public health wants to be contacted, they want to develop that relationship, and there are many opportunities to practice that communication system. There is certainly a what we call a mandatory reporting list, so a number of diseases that are mandatory to report, anthrax for example, or smallpox, or any one of these being on the list. The problem is usually you report that after it's been diagnosed, either you know by a culture or a biopsy, and that can take some time. And unfortunately, that time is enough that there could be more disease cases spreading. And really, when you get public health involved, you want to do it early, not late with that mandatory reporting. And our usual public health surveillance systems involve hospitals and clinics reporting to public health authorities conditions that we believe need to be monitored on a regular basis. Influenza-like illness or an ILI, we see every day in our office. I see every day in my office in a pulmonary clinic practice. And, it'd be, and it's very difficult to pick out uh, somebody who, who, at least initially, might be coming down with something like anthrax or developing a, a plague pneumonia. But in the main, they'll show themselves, they'll be more severe, there'll be more of them, they'll be in atypical populations. The idea of reporting and calling your local health department really should happen early on when you have any suspicion that this is an unusual, you know, infectious or chemical disease. So if there is something that raises, you know, the hairs on the back of your neck and makes you as a clinician think that there's really something wrong, that's a good enough reason to call your public health department and at least get them involved early on. When you're seeing patients one after another, people, uh, people with all sorts of ailments, how to look at that environment and say, could this be something out of the ordinary? Could this be something that shouldn't be there? And that becomes a, a true art form. If you saw a patient with a typical rash that looked like smallpox, even one case of smallpox would be bioterrorism, and you would need to sound the alarm and call public health and call law enforcement. And you need to know how to access them 24 hours a day, whether this happens at 3 p.m. or 3 a.m. You should understand that perhaps a rash fever, if it's in the wrong distribution, if it, uh, if it doesn't have the right characteristics, if they seem sicker, if they're uh, in, in a population that shouldn't have that, if they're uh, particularly uh, coming in groups, or, then, then that should be a red flag. Examples of that might be if you're working in the hospital and you see a few cases of pneumonia in otherwise young, healthy people, that's relatively unusual and you know, probably needs to be reported. Uh, more recent outbreaks of influenza associated with you know, large die-offs of, of chicken, chickens and ducks. You know, if they say that they've maybe, you know, they have a febrile illness and they had a recent exposure to this animal die-off, that certainly can be something that would raise a, a significant number of red flags. Most of the uh, diseases that we're dealing with in terms of, of uh, biologic agents are really zoonotic diseases. There'll be animal deaths. There'll be uh, either veterinarians will see this. There'll be red flags. The emergency rooms will, will start to see things. So you'll, you'll have a public health surveillance strata that can perhaps pick up something unusual in the environment. If there was travel to certain areas and this was disease associated with travel, that may be a reason as well. So any one of those can allow you to call your public health department where they can institute you know, surveillance, other case reporting, and really get working on the case early rather than waiting until you know, after the horse is out of the barn and it's reported on a test, but here you had this incubation and spread period where the intervention didn't occur. Do health departments have people on call so that if you see something at night that you need information on, you can contact them? Yeah, so all county and state health departments, including the federal health department, which is the CDC, all have someone on call. The common term is the duty officer, but there is either a health officer or an, or an epidemiologic nurse on call where you can actually call these things in. If you have a chemical emergency or a situation where it looks like there is some kind of toxicological problem, you can call the poison center and get through right away. 
The Poison ha Center has uh, trained toxicologists, has specialists in poison information. You can wind up giving us the best clinical picture that you can give us and we can try and help you put a finger on it and try and help you understand what's going on. Uh, it's really important to try and get as accurate of information as you can so that we can make the best assessment and help you make the best plan. They should become familiar with the key websites for their local health department and through their local health department they will usually have access to all the authoritative sites that they need access to including their state health department, Centers for Disease Control, World Health Organizations. So that's where I would start with, is start locally, because usually, usually your local health department is going to have links to the key authoritative, authoritative sites. So Christian, we, we've uh, talked a lot. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of information on these topics, and um, it's actually a little bit overwhelming. Um, what do you think the take-home message should be? Well, uh, that's, even though we just have skimmed the surface of a lot of these agents, I think there's a couple take-home messages um, that would really encompass the chemical, uh, biological, and radiologic agents. And, you know, we can probably look at them as far as treatment, staff protection, and then early uh, response and public health contact. I think, obviously, as far as recognition with our patients, we need to know that, you know, these are diseases that are often rare but can present either as an agent of terrorism or as an industrial accident or as naturally occurring infectious diseases. And that in order to have that, um, avail that, that awareness available, we really have to look for those things that happen in our patients that are different. So for example, becoming ill after maybe going recently to a contact, a series of cases which are just very much the same coming in through the emergency department. And those things should really you know, trigger us to think more largely about this. And then setting in your office practice and, and not, uh, not and thinking each time, saying, is this what I expect to find? Is this the right way? Is there something unusual? If you just practice a little introspective or perspective medicine along the way, you'll be the one to pick up that next epidemic. And then to take the next step of early involvement and response. So that would be, you know, on the chemical side, that would be really activating decontamination in your facility very early making sure hazmat and you know, plant operations at your hospital is immediately involved or your healthcare facility, and then also activating the, your emergency plan so that all your healthcare workers are ready to have whatever antidote or equipment that they need. When you talk about some of these biologicals and potentially chemicals, you're talking about a marathon. And how do you sustain a marathon when you're trying to isolate the community, when you're trying to protect your providers, all levels of providers. How do you clean the rooms? How do you make food? How do you give shelter to the people who are working? Those are tough questions. What you should do is identify what the critical functions are for your organization, whether you're working in a hospital, a clinic, a pre-hospital system. What do you need to continue to take care of patients? And if you didn't have access to any of those things, how would you get them? Having this awareness provides your staff with some you know, some, you and your staff with some protection. So if this ends up being a chemical agent, the knowledge that, number one, the patient needs to be de decontaminated, and number two, if not, I need to wear some protective equipment, really is a big step and probably should be the big first step for many healthcare providers when they interact with those patients. Likewise, on the biologic agents, that this is a biologic agent, it has a high propensity to be contagious, I need to wear my appropriate equipment and then alert the authorities and make sure my colleagues are wearing those, that appropriate equipment and if needed the patients in, a, in the right room such as an isolation room um, that those things happen early on. What we see very often in disease is it may take a day and by then you've contaminated or exposed large members in the healthcare community that's much more difficult to handle and I think if you walked away with this with the idea that these either can be terrorism or naturally occurring accidents or events we need to really be aware that they are possible and we have to take the first few steps of early recognition, contact with public health and protection, I think we'd be a long way into having our response be significantly better. Keep your ears and your eyes open. You will find the right answer. I have immense faith in uh, healthcare providers to respond to unpredictable 
events. I think that's the, the key component. A, a group of providers, a system of providers that is exercised in hazmat, is exercised in disaster medicine, and part of that obviously would be the, uh, the terrorist type of attack. And then the last thing, if it's, if it's they can remember, and that's the, the three R's, to just recognize there's a problem, okay? You know who to report to and how. And then the last one is to respond, to take basic measures and use common sense and apply basic principles to minimize risk to themselves, their staff, and their patients. Thank you for watching. We've learned how important it is to be observant. You should keep your eyes open. If you see something unusual or have concerns, contact the appropriate authorities. A family plan is a very important element of preparedness. You should have one. Health professionals should know what their role would be in the event of a disaster. If you'd like more information on these topics, please visit UCTV's website.